So, exciting, nice plan to try and flux the Centauri. Uh, people like the Breakthrough break Starshot Project are thinking about how one might actually be able to send a mission to this. I mean, it's beyond our current technology, but it might not be impossible to send like a smartphone sized probe past it sometime in the next 20 or 30 years um, with a few technological breakthroughs en route. But this is perhaps most interesting because it's the archetype of the planet around a red dwarf star. And red dwarfs seem to be the best places for having life in some respects. I mean, the argument in favour, many similar planets in the habitable zone, so in principle their temperature is right to have liquid water, with roughly Earth mass or two Earth masses or something like that, are close in. I think we found around lots of red dwarf stops. Proxima is the nearest, but we've already talked about like Trappist 1b and so on. There are quite a few of these things. They're probably tidally locked. Because they're so close to a star, imagine my head is a star, it will always move around so that one side is facing. It's not going to spin around its own axis as it goes around. One would expect them to be tidally locked like the Earth is to the, the Moon is to the Earth. One might think these are the best places for life. After all, 70% of all stars are red dwarfs. We know they have more planets, so the vast majority of planets in habitable zone, rocky planets in our galaxy are probably around red dwarfs. So purely from the stats, they're the most likely place to find aliens. And they're also a really good place because they're very long lasting. I mean, our own sun, it's sort of 4.6 billion years old, so only got another roughly same amount of time, 5 billion years to go before it swells up and swallows the Earth. Whereas red dwarfs, they last like 100 billion years. No red dwarf has ever died. They, their lifespan is longer than the age of the universe at the moment. So if you wanted to have a civilization that's going to go on for a very long time, this seemed like a good place to put it. But there are some arguments about why maybe there isn't going to be lots of life around these things. I mean, one question is, I mean, if these are the most common planets and the best ones for life, why do we not live around a red dwarf star? We're living around a yellow dwarf star, much more bright, much rarer. Surely you'd expect us, the one example we know of life, to be around the most common star for life. I'm not trying to leave that. I think it's a statistical argument. If it was a one in a million, then you'd think it's rare. But, you know, more massive stars are sort of one in three or so. So that's not a particularly incredible fluke. So I'm not convinced by that. But there are some arguments about why red dwarfs might not be good places for life. First of all, flares and radiation. Most red dwarf stars have big flares, and our own sun has flares every now and then, but the flares around the red dwarfs are much more violent, and maybe that's going to irradiate the planet and sterilise it, kill everything on the surface. Then there's a whole principle about tidal locking. If a planet always has one side facing its star, that one side's going to get very, very hot, the other opposite side's going to get very, very cold, there's not going to be much of the zone at a nice temperature, and there might be horrific winds or strange weather conditions that mean that life is just not possible. It might be just scoured clean by the extreme weather on these things. And the third argument is the pre-main sequence evolution. The very the early history of these stars, they would have been baked dry. So we'll talk about these doubts in turn. So flares and radiation. On average, red dwarf stars actually don't put out that much radiation, that many flares. So the normal day-to-day -day radiation dose that, say, Proxima Centauri b gets from Proxima Centauri is no worse than the dose the Earth gets from the Sun, on average. The difference is only during the flares, and the flares are fairly rare, not all the time. So day-to-day, -day, you're fine, but the flares are pretty nasty. They pop out a lot of radiation. How much gets through the atmosphere will depend on what the atmosphere is, we have no idea. However, what we can say is, first of all, we can expose Earth bacteria to the same sort of radiation that they would get during the middle of a really nasty flare of Proxima Centauri, and it kills most of them, but about 10% survive. And as long as any of them survive, then evolution is going to keep them going, and they'll evolve highly radiation-resistant bacteria. So it seems like, at least earthly bacteria, the radiation dose on Proxima is not vacant for all of them. It's vacant for a lot of them, it certainly wouldn't be nice, but of course that will then give evolutionary pressure and the remaining bacteria will get better and better at withstanding radiation, perhaps with better cell repair and DNA repair mechanisms in their cells. And the other killer argument is that on Earth, we estimate that when the sun was very young, it put out a lot more radiation 
And in fact, the Earth's surface was exposed to radiation as bad as during a flare in Proxima Centauri, back when the Earth was young. But when the Earth was young, life gets started here. So it does seem that, at least on Earth, life can survive this radiation. So it's a struggle, but it's possible. And in the very early days, when life was getting started on Earth, it did survive this much radiation. So I think the consensus now is the flares and radiation, they're nasty, but they're not fatal. It means there's a colony on the planet, we might have to have a radiation warning go and run in a bunker every now and then. That might be okay. Tidal locking. Is half the planet too hot and too cold? Well, people have tried modelling this. There have been a number of attempts to model what the atmosphere would look like. And this is very difficult because we don't know how big the atmosphere is, we don't know what it's made out of, we don't know what the pressure is. But let's imagine that we give a, I don't know, an Earth-like atmosphere to a planet, and then we could actually use the same computer models that are used to give the weather forecasts. This particular paper, for example, uses the British Bureau of Meteorology weather. It's used to give British weather forecasts, only applies it to a planet. In this case, they give it a roughly Earth-like atmosphere, but they put it around Proxima Centauri with a different radiation in, and not have it spinning, have it tidally locked. And what do you get? Well, here's the temperature. And what you can find is that by and large, the temperature is above zero over the entire day side. The night side is pretty cold, down to 145, so that's uh, minus 115 or something, so it's going to be an ice, definitely, in some of the polar regions on the far side. But the whole near side is at a reasonably pleasant temperature. It's a tender reason. It's a bit cold, but uh, not too bad. I mean, uh, someone from the north of Canada would find it very pleasant. Here's their prediction for cloud cover and wind. And basically what they're saying is the entire day side, if you take this model, is going to be perpetually covered by a cloud. It's a bit like where I grew up in London. There's always cloud. Um, there's not much wind on the day side, so it's going to be calm and cloudy and cold, but no worse than London in winter. Then the night side, it's going to be very the dark side is going to be very, very clear, and there is going to be a steady wind. But the winds are not too bad. I mean, it's a steady 50 meters per second in the middle of the night side, but no one's going to be there anyway. The day side, which is where life will exist, the winds are fairly light. So that sounds plausible. And you can calculate the amount of rain you'd get, and it turns out the zone with perpetual cloud is going to also be a zone of perpetual rain. So actually, it does sound rather a lot like London, actually. Lots and lots of rain all the time, lots and lots of clouds, temperatures, you know, 10 centigrade or something like that. So very much like uh, English winter. So it doesn't look like there's any obvious thing in if you assume this type of atmosphere. And again, we have no idea what the atmosphere is like. If it did have an Earth-like atmosphere, the weather would not be a killer. What might be a killer is the pre-main sequence evolution. Now, at the moment, stars power themselves by nuclear fusion in the centre. But when stars are very young, that's actually not the main power source. Now, basically, they've formed by collapsing gas. And as that gas steadily shrinks and shrinks, it gives up its gravitational potential energy and turns it into heat. And eventually, it shrinks enough that nuclear fusion starts off and it moves off onto the so-called main sequence. So this pre-main sequence, so-called Hayashi tracks, is how stars power themselves very early on. And it means that in these very early stages, stars are actually a lot brighter than they turn out to be later. Now, for a star like our own Sun, this initial stage doesn't last very long. It's probably over by the point of the planets are really solidified and formed. But around red dwarf stars, this pre-main sequence period, this period when things powered by gravity, can last a very long time, like 100 million years which is much longer than the time for planets to form. So when the planets are still have formed, the, the Sun, this red dwarf star, is still much bigger and much brighter than it will eventually end up being. So where we calculate the habitable zone now is not where the habitable zone would have been for that first 50 or 100 million years. For the first 50 or 100 million years, the star would have been much brighter and that would have baked these planets. And so it's quite possible that these planets have been baked so hot early on that all the volatiles, all the water, all the atmosphere has been boiled off. And then as the star settles down and starts doing its very pathetic nuclear fusion in the middle of a red dwarf star, by the time it settles down, at that point it's too late. All the volatiles, all the things that are going to give us our lovely habitable oceans and atmosphere have all gone, been blown away. And this is a very serious worry. And everything I've told you so far seems to be the truth. If the planet starts off 
Earth-like atmosphere, it will lose its atmosphere. I think that's pretty clear. However, there is one possible way out, that maybe the planet actually started off with much more gas than the Earth and lost a lot of it. It might have started off like a mini Neptune, then it loses a lot of that, and what's left over is actually somewhat habitable. So this currently is the big debate about habitability of these systems. Um, if a planet starts off Earth-like, it's going to get bait, gone, no volatiles, nothing is going to give you any liquid or anything like that. It might be the right temperature for water, but the water is all going to be baked away. So what we've got to hope is the planets actually formed quite a bit bigger. They maybe migrated in, maybe they formed further out where there were more icy planetesimals to make water, then migrated in. We know that migration happens in some solar systems. Got exposed to this initial burst of heat, and that blew away a lot of the Neptune-like hydrogen helium, leaving you with perhaps a potentially habitable core. So is there life around these things like Proxima Centauri? We don't know. That is the major question.